everyone, my name is Daniel Backer and welcome to Write Better Stories. Today I'm going to talk about an awesome book called A Rage in Harlem by Chester Himes. So this was a really good palate cleanser after I finished the last book I read, The Bottom of the Sky. If you watched that video on my channel, you know that I had a lot of complaints about it. I thought a lot of the prose was very indulgent and a lot of its postmodern play was a little bit um, uninspiring and not really fun. Like I said, there were a lot of fun scenes in the book, but I think that it exhibited a lot of the worst of what I find in postmodern lit. So, this was a complete shift away from that sort of style. This plot is just airtight, there's not an ounce of fat on it, and literally from the very first scene, we are completely plunged into this story. There's no long indulgent descriptions, there's not a lot of like interpretation required. I am going to offer a little bit today, as well as uh, doing a reading of one of the better written sections in the book. But what is really nice about, I think, detective fiction in general is that it's so story driven. And even the characters are thin, but I would say in a good way that um, we don't have to get inside of the minds of these characters and do these really deep explorations. Everything serves the story, and I think that a lot of genre fiction in this way is actually superior to liter uh, literary fiction, because literary fiction gives itself a lot more permission to indulge, to go into different tangents, and as a writer, even though I'm inspired by a lot of those literary greats who have really dense symbolism and it requires a lot of interpretation, I think that I have just as much to learn from people whose priority is to just engage the reader. That's something that I don't think a lot of literary fiction is quite as good at. However, a lot of writers that I admire, like Thomas Pynchon and David Foster Wallace, they were actually big proponents of exploring genre fiction in order to get that reader engagement. And so I don't want anyone to get the impression that just because this is a genre novel, it's in some way less than literary fiction. A lot of people who like literary fiction, I think are sort of pretentious and they like to look down on genre fiction, but there is still a lot of skill that's required. And when you pad a lot of your story and investigation with all these philosophical musings, I think it's a little easier to obscure the quality and uh, with all of that like long-winded exploration, um, we don't really know if all of that is totally necessary. Whereas in a book that's this tightly written and very simple, and straightforward in its style. We, we know how elegant it is and how complex it had to have been constructed, even though it's a little bit easier to read than some of these postmodern works that I review on this channel. So um, a lot of this book too, just the narrative momentum that it carries is really inspiring. And that's something I'd like to bring to my writing because it doesn't really give you any time to get bored. Like I said, from that very first scene, you're immediately plunged into the action. And that's something that I would like to bring into my writing, whether I'm trying to do something more symbolic and literary or something a lot more straightforward. And really, this book makes me want to do something a lot more straightforward. I'm uh, finishing a novel right now that I've been working on for about four years. And even though I'm very proud of where it's going, it does seem like I'm seeing the limits of a lot of these people who've inspired me. Um, they're obviously great, I'm not trying to compare myself to them, but since they inspired me, I was um, enthusiastic about being very symbolic and very meandering and deep and heavy, and now I'm start starting to see, it's like maybe that's kind of a hangover from college for me. Maybe going forward for my next project, I would like to do something like a noir, something a little uh, simpler on the themes, but more story driven. So. Um, just a little bit more preamble. A lot of this reminds me too of what I like about the Safdie Brothers films, Uncut Gems and Good Time, because I would say especially with Good Time, but Uncut Gems as well, is that it just, from the first scene, dives you into that action. So I will um, now talk a little bit more about the actual book. In the initial scene, our main character, Jackson, is with um, Imabel, his lover, and then a guy named Hank, and then a guy named Jody. And Jackson has amassed a bunch of money that he's gonna have Hank and Jody um, counterfeit to make it more money, basically. I guess they're called, it's called like raising the dollar, so he brings them a bunch of tens and they're gonna turn them into 100s. 
And um, what's cool is that it actually ends up to be a scam against Jackson. So he thinks that he is going to get away with making all of this extra money. But within the first scene, they set off something in the oven to make the oven explode, supposedly ruining all of his money. And then a marshal barges in who turns out to be a fake marshal. And the marshal is actually the secondary lover of Emma Bell, or actually her husband, I believe. Is that that's who Slim ends up being? So uh, Jackson is actually the other lover, and the whole thing was sort of um, orchestrated in order to um, scam Jackson. And so when the marshal barges in, all the other conspirators run out, and then Jackson uh, pleads with the man, and uh, the fake marshal says that he'll take a bribe to let Jackson go and to drop a counterfeiting charge. And so then Jackson has to go and steal money from his boss. He works as an undertaker, and so he goes and steals the money from his boss, but he has to steal extra money because he needed money in the first place. So he steals extra money, pays off the marshal, and then with the rest of the money, he takes a cab and then goes gambling in order to try to make more money from this money that he stole, and he loses it all. And so what I just really like about this from a storytelling perspective is, like I said, you're just there in the first scene within a couple pages you already have huge stakes you already know what jackson has to do he has to try to figure out uh he thinks the guy's an actual marshal so he doesn't want to get arrested for this counterfeiting charge and he's already making all of these decisions that have huge consequences and so that's something that on this channel i refer to as the anticipation of action which is another way of saying suspense but i like to say anticipation of action because suspense sometimes evokes the idea of a mood more than it does an actual story device. So just wanted to clarify that. But when Jackson goes and steals the money from his boss, um, that's setting up expectations for the reader that there are more things to come. We can't end the story right there. We have to see what's the fallout of him stealing this money. When he goes gambling and then loses all of the money, again, it's like, oh, okay, we just could not possibly end the story right there. So much more needs to happen. And a lot of that anticipation of action I have heard actually from screenwriting instruction. That's the thing that a lot of amateur writers don't put into their stories. And it hurts the story because you want to have some sort of narrative momentum and a thrust and a reason for the reader or the viewer to uh, want to finish your story. If you're making a short, then that might not be as necessary. You can get away with some exploration and some and whimsy, but I think for anything of considerable length, like a feature film or a novel, you need a little bit of that narrative thrust and momentum to make the reader want to turn the page. Now, that's not a hard and fast rule. A lot of these writers that I like to read on this channel, uh, like Juna Barnes or uh, a lot of the postmodern writers, don't necessarily do this quite as much. They have really engaging prose, and so I'm not gonna tell you that anticipation of action within your scene work based on the character actions and their consequences is the only way to make that narrative engagement, but why would you not wanna do that? Why would you not wanna make your literary story, even if you are gonna be symbolic, why would you not want to make the story really exciting too, that you wanna make the reader find out what happens? So another thing that makes this book really good is this exploration of marginalized identities. Um, this, I believe, is prominent in a lot of ways because it's an early example of black detective fiction. It might actually be one of the first. I don't exactly know. But um, this is right up there for me with Raymond Chandler and Dashiell Hammett. I would say that this is probably the best noir book I've ever read for all of those reasons I've already described. Um, but then you do get just... It, it sets itself apart a little bit more because it is dominantly about black characters. And then also I thought it was interesting that Jackson's twin brother is referred to as a female impersonator. And so he is a drag queen, basically. And um, this took place in Harlem in the 1950s. And that is very historically significant because Harlem during the Harlem Renaissance was actually a prominent center for the gay community of color. And then by the 1950s, this became a more fraught identity. It was definitely controversial during the Harlem Renaissance as well. But by the 1950s, a lot of the civil rights movement had also a lot of mixed feelings about um, black queer people because they saw that this might um, harm the black community's chances at integration. And so 
That's definitely something that gets explored in this book, not necessarily explicitly, but there's more of a backdrop to um, the, uh, the character's name is Goldie, and then he lives with two other drag queens, and they're referred to as the Black Widows. And uh, I thought that that was just interesting because it's not like, we don't get a long historical description in the book, but if you're familiar with that, it fleshes out the world a little bit more and brings a level of engagement and interest that I don't think you necessarily see in Raymond Chandler and Dashiell Hammett, even though I love those guys also. So I'm going to include a dissertation, I believe it is, that I found online that goes much more in depth, and I'll cite the specific pages in the PDF if you wanna look a little bit more into that historical backdrop of uh, the black queer community in Harlem and in other parts of the country too. So uh, feel free to check on that in the description if you're interested in that more. And lastly, I'm going to do a reading to show you some of the really good writing. And this one stuck out to me right away. It's on page 93 in my edition. And as I was looking at some of the comments on Goodreads, other people had noted this one too. So this is, I think, just a popular paragraph in the book. So, looking eastward from the towers of Riverside Church, perched among the university buildings on the high banks of the Hudson River in a valley far below, waves of gray rooftops distort the perspective like the surface of a sea. Below the surface, in the murky waters of fetid tenements, a city of black people who are convulsed in desperate living like the voracious churning of millions of hungry cannibal fish, blind mouths eating their own guts. Um, I just thought that was really awesome writing, and it's not like indulgent, like a lot of bottom of the sky that I read as the last book. So um, just in conclusion, this is a great book to read if you're getting a little bit sick of some of the more indulgent prose of these postmodern writers, but you still want something that has a really engaging story and isn't just total fluff. Um, I really enjoyed this book. It's probably one of my favorite books that I read this year. And like I said, probably the best detective book that I've ever read. Um, and it has a really cool ending about the uh, uh, Jackson and Emma Bell, who's the femme fatale in the book. And I don't want to give that away in this video. I still want you to read it. Usually I would give it away, but uh, um, since this is such a plot driven book, I'd love you to actually experience it for yourself. And uh, of course, a plane goes over right at the end. I hope this helps you write better stories. Goodbye.